In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Now, if y'all want to get out ahead of me, the first verse we're going to is Matthew 10, 15. Now, I am going to switch back and forth a little bit between Amplified and Amplified Classic. I normally do Classic. What they have is the older version. It's now called the Amplified Classic. They revised it back in 2015, and now this one's the Amplified. I don't know. I think part of it's a marketing ploy. They, should, they couldn't just say Amplified 1 and Amplified 2. I don't know. Now, we are continuing our series on Jesus, not religion. And the part we are covering for Jesus' personality tonight is his cunning. Now, for thousands of years, people have misrepresented or misunderstood what Jesus did and said in the Bible. The same way that we get misunderstood or we misunderstand someone when an email or a text message gets misread. And the importance of tone of voice and the context for what someone is saying in written text cannot be understated. The whole purpose of this series is to try to take the religious fog off of Jesus from near, that near enough 2,000 years of forced, forced solemnity has put on him. We've seen how Jesus is generous, playful, honest, fiercely intentional, free, and most importantly, human. The humanity of Jesus is what's been removed from the religious traditions that surround him. Easter is when we focus on Jesus' resurrection, but people forget that he wasn't resurrected as a spirit. He was resurrected as a human. Now, as we've discussed, a lot of what Jesus did worked actively against the Pharisees and other religious and what the Pharisees and other religious leaders were teaching because they were concerned with external holiness and external appearances when God is far more concerned with internal holiness. Much of what we've learned about Jesus would upset the churchy people and has disrupted our ideas of how Jesus lived and followed the calling that God had for him. This lesson... Do I need to switch? Okay. Hello. Yep, still there. Where was I? This lesson, thank you, works pretty hard in that direction. As we proceed, remember that the word Christian means little Christ. That our walk is led by the same Holy Spirit that indwelled Jesus and raised Jesus from the dead. Remember that. See, in Matthew 10, Jesus is giving the disciples their directions like a general sending out troops. They've been given the power and authority that we have, the same power and authority we have, to do miracles in his name, like healing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing the lepers, and casting out demons. Now, I don't want to think about how many sermons have been written about Matthew 10. People usually stop with the warning that Jesus gives in verse 14, or 15. See, in Matthew 10, 15, he says, I assure you and most solemnly tell you, it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for the city, than for that city, since it rejected the Messiah's messenger. That's a good warning that preachers use to put fear into the congregation about the dangers of not accepting Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Now, those dangers are very real. The sin of unbelief is the only thing that ever sends you to hell. I'm not belittling that because that's the way God set it up. I can't change that. But using it to manipulate people is exactly what Jesus was against. Manipulating them into doing what you're telling them when Romans 2.4 says that it's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. 
says there, or are you so blind as to trifle with and presume upon and to despise and underestimate the wealth of his kindness and forbearance and long-suffering patience? Are you unmindful or actually ignorant of the fact that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repent, to change your mind and inner man, and to accept God's will? Now, thank you for going along on that brief tangent with me. (laughs) But we're going to continue in Jesus' address to the disciples in Matthew 10. Jesus doesn't stop where the preachers stop. He gives them instructions through the whole rest of the chapter about what to expect and how to handle all the trials that await them. But we're only going to look at verse 16. Matthew 10, 16 in the Amplified Classic says, Behold, I am sending you out like sheep in the midst of wolves. Be wary and wise as serpents, and be innocent or harmless, guileless, and without falsity as doves. Well, see, we like the innocent as doves part. But that that bit about being as wise and as wary, in some verses, some translations say as cunning and as shrewd as a serpent, that kind of butts up against what we've been talked about how a Christian acts, doesn't it? If you call someone a snake, it's normally not meant in good in good humor. <laughs> But that's how Jesus tells them to act. So let's get the religious drapery off of what Jesus said there in Matthew 10, 16. It's a dove and a snake. And normally when we think of a dove, we think of when the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus at his baptism in the form of a dove. The snake, though. You see, that's what Satan came as when he deceived Eve in the garden, which is what any Jewish person would relate to would relate that to. So be innocent as the Holy Spirit and be as cunning as Satan. What? (laughs) But that's what it says. And it's wild to think about, but the disciples were probably standing there thinking, yeah, Jesus, we know. We've got God on our side. We're going to be fine. And he's telling them, no, no, you you need to take this serious. He's sending us, the same way he sent the disciples, into a jungle war zone with a butter knife for protection. You must be holy and you must be cunning. And think about the context of Jesus' life up to now. I mean, we've covered it, but it bears repeating The disciples have been with him for a few years, but Jesus has been hunted his entire life. Mary and Joseph had to flee and stay in Egypt for three years so that Jesus wouldn't be murdered as a baby. In the three years of his ministry, Jesus has had to duck out of town a few times so he wouldn't be taken by the thugs. He know and he knows what's going on. He knows that he's behind enemy lines, so to speak. He's starting a revolution, and the timing of everything is essential, even the timing of his death. You see, by now, he's got years of shucking and jiving, as I like to call it, out of the way and slipping slipping off when people come to try to get him to do something or force him into something that's not the Father's will for him. He gets out, he outwits the enemy and the religious leaders without looking like that's what he's doing. He trains the disciples to keep going after he's gone, even though they seem to have the common sense of a three-year-old when you read the Bible sometimes. Now, after Jesus is tempted in the wilderness in Matthew 4, he's performing miracles. He's casting out demons. The outcasts are being drawn into him, and the thrill of something new is surrounding Jesus as the crowds of the downtrodden and the brokenhearted swell day after day. Now this mob is trying to seize Jesus and trying to make him their king soon, which he also avoids. And so he offers them this instead. In Matthew 5, verses 17 through 19, he tells the mob, crowd, whatever they call it, do not think that I have come to do away with or undo the law or the prophets. 
I have come not to do away with or undo, but to complete and fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until the sky and earth pass away and perish, not one smallest letter nor one little hook, identifying certain Hebrew letters, will pass from the law until all things it foreshadows are accomplished. Whoever then breaks or does away with or relaxes one of the least important of these commandments and teaches men to do so shall be called the least important in the kingdom of heaven. But he who practices them and teaches others to do so shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. In three short years, the movement started by Jesus is seriously going to disrupt the Jewish system. Literally, the world will never be the same after Jesus. And this, these three verses, are how he manages the crowd. He discourages anarchy by teaching them about a genuine internal holiness. Mobs are about as stable as plutonium, if you didn't know. A, a, what is it? It's a line from Men in Black. A person is smart. People are stupid. Especially when you get them in a big group. And the crowd is, by the way, they've already tried to throw him off of a cliff. Jesus knows how dangerous these people can be. And another group is going to try a coup. And people are as violent now as they were then. Please do not misunderstand. The Colosseums were up and running when Jesus was alive. Now, that takes care of the crowd, but he also had to take care of the religious authorities too. He had to keep them on the back foot. He tells them that he isn't coming to undo the law, but to fulfill it. He throws off the crowd and the Pharisees with this. And Jesus doesn't get sucked in prematurely to the escalating conflict. He continues to maneuver his way. And I know people aren't going to like hearing that Jesus was maneuvering and outflanking and doing this. But if you're behind enemy lines, you're in a battle. That's exactly what you're doing. So in Matthew 22... Verses 15 through 22, it says, Then the Pharisees went and consulted and plotted together how they might engage Jesus in his talk. And they sent their disciples to him um, among with the Her Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere in what you profess to be, and that you teach the way of God truthfully, regardless of consequences and being, f being afraid of no man. For you are impartial and do not regard either the person or the position of anyone. Tell us then what you think about this. That's a setup if I've ever heard one. Tell us then what you think about this. Is it lawful to pay tribute levied on individuals and to be paid yearly to Caesar or not? He's asking if he should pay his taxes. <laughs> That's all it is. You tell, you tell me. You know what's right. You understand how things are supposed to be done. Do I have to pay my taxes? Well, we know that. They were trying to get, they were trying to get him caught. <coughs> but Jesus, aware of their malicious plot, asked, Why do you put me to the test and try to entrap me? You pretenders. You hypocrites. Show me the money used for the tribute. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and title are, are these? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Pay therefore to Caesar the things that are due to Caesar, and pay to God the things that are due to God. When they heard it, they were amazed and marveled, and he left them and departed. Be wary and as wise as a snake. Jesus sees the trap laid out for him, and he just sidesteps it. Jesus knows that public image is a delicate thing, and being guilty by association is an easy way to be dismissed. Labeling someone as a group that you don't care for, be it charismatic, reformer, fundamentalist, progressive, conservative, liberal, whatever you don't like, if you do that, you slap a label on somebody, you don't even have to argue their case because you can dismiss them out of hand. You are the clear moral winner because of their horrible deficiencies in ideology. It's a cheap and effective ploy that humanity has used, I imagine, since about the first or second time people started to argue. 
two farmers argue about something. Well, you can't listen to him. He plots, he, you know, he farms wheat. You can't listen to him. He plots soybeans. I can only imagine that that's a conversation that happened some thousands of years ago. You see, but religious people like their indignation. We tar and feather the heathen. But Jesus just won't get suckered in. It doesn't matter to him who the opponent is. If we go to Matthew 21, verses 23 through 27, after I have a drink of water, and when he entered the sacred enclosure of the temple, the chief priests and elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching it and said, by what power of authority are you doing these things and who gave you the power of authority? You talked about a dumb question. Anyway, sorry. Jesus answered them, verse 24. I will also ask you a question, and if you give me the answer, then I will tell you by what power and authority I do these things. The baptism of John, from where was it? From heaven or from men? And they reasoned and argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will ask us, why, did, why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, we are afraid of and must reckon with the multitude, for they all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what power and authority I do these things. The same leaders try to stop Jesus and ask him who gave him to the authority to do what he was doing. He's been telling y'all. For coming up on three years, we're getting to, that's in the back half of Matthew. He's been doing this for a while, and he isn't shy about who tells him to do what he does. And still, they go, who tells you, who gave you the power? So he just boxes them in the way that they tried to box him in, and he walks away. Jesus still isn't working his best with these people, though. You see, Jesus is at his best. He is at his most cunning, or some of his most cunning. When he's talking to people with hearts that he's trying to win over. You see, now last time we talked about freedom. And the freedom that Jesus has, we have, if we choose to operate in it. And we mentioned the Samaritan woman at the well. We're going to go back to the Samaritan woman. That's in John chapter 4, starting in verse 9 is where we're going to pick it up. Now, if you weren't here, I will keep the history of the Jewish people and the Samaritan people brief because it's 600 years of really not liking each other. I'm going to keep it about that brief. They had 600 years of really not liking each other. They taught that it was a sin to talk to the other people. It wasn't just something you avoid. You just don't cross to the other side of the street. You do not engage. You do not talk. Complete avoidance, complete dismissal. <coughs> so Jesus, a rabbi, no less, starts a conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well of Jacob. And a woman with a reputation for being promiscuous. Now she knows it's a scandal for Jesus even to talk with her. And he tells her as much. Or she tells him as much. I got my people backward. Because what happened right before this is Jesus sat down to talk. He sent the disciples into town to get food, and he said, hey, how about a drink? He didn't say it quite like that. He spoke it in Aramaic. I'm in the 21st century. He wasn't. But that's about what he said. Hey, how about a drink? And then verse 9. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan and a woman, for a drink? For the Jews have nothing to do with the Samaritans. Now she's, she, she is a tough one. This is first century Palestine, modern day Palestine. Women don't have a whole heck of a lot of rights. And she just went ahead and she talked back to him. I kind of like her. <laughs> Spicy. And she doesn't know what to read into this. So she's bucking up against the man that she thinks Jesus is. In verse 10, Jesus answered her, 
If you had only known and recognized God's gift and who this is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him instead and he would have given you living water. See, now Jesus' reply is basically saying, chill out. I am not who you think I am. Take you down a moment. But she says to him in verse 11, Sir, I'd love to hear the sarcasm. Sir, you have nothing to draw with, no drawing bucket, and the well is deep. How then can you provide living water? Where do you get your living water? Now, can you see her head? In my head, she's got a hand on a hip. She's got a water jug under the other arm. Her neck's cocked off to the side a little bit, and she's about to do this. That's, a, that's how she looks in my head. But if she did that, you know, she'd drop the water jug. <coughs> she's all revved up and ready to go. She tells him, you don't even have a bucket and some rope, and you're talking about giving me living water. What are you doing? What are you trying to do? Sass for days. And she even amps up the tension in verse 12. She says, are you greater than and superior to our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well and who used to drink from it himself, his sons and his cattle also? See, now dragging Jacob into this conversation is just throwing fuel onto the fire. Because the Samaritans were seen by the Jews as half-breeds. And she knows it. She's picking a fight. She expects this teacher to act like all of the other Pharisees. Yet... Jesus ignores every attempt that she makes to offend him. And so here's the cunning. He gets her to buy into what he's saying. Jesus answered her, verse 13. All who drink of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever takes a drink of the water that I will give him shall never, no, never, be thirsty anymore. But the water that I will give him shall be bo- become a spring of water, welling up, flowing, bubbling, continually, <coughs> excuse me, continually, all the way, or continually within him, unto, into, or for eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so that I may never get thirsty, nor have to come continually all the way here to draw. At this... Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come back here. And the woman answered, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you're darn right you don't. Oh, I'm sorry, that's not not what it says. It's not written down that way. Jesus said to her, you have spoken truly by saying I have no husband. And there's the whammy. You see, this conversation's been a boxing match. She comes out swinging and he just dodges and gets to work. Jesus has been setting a trap for this woman, and she just falls in. Now, I wasn't there in person to see this conversation take place. My parents, grandparents, to whatever power you care to choose, likely had not been thought of yet. But there's something that goes on in this conversation. Only in God's eyes. You see, now, if you go to verse 15, where she says, Sir, give me this water so that I may never get thirsty, nor have to come continually all the way here to draw, something happened there. I don't know if her body language said she was coming on to Jesus. I'm not sure. She's, it would be within her reputation. I hate to say it, but it would be. But something shifts, because after that, Jesus said, Go call your husband. Go get your husband. Come back. Something provokes Jesus into telling her that. So she starts to hide after he mentioned her husband. And with the trap laid, he just pulls the rug out from under her. Verse 17 and 18. The woman answered, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you've spoken truly in saying I have no husband. For you've had five husbands, and the man you're living with now is not your husband. In this, you've spoken truly. Ooh. 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 They don't talk about being Jesus about Jesus being cunning like this, do they? Not that I've ever seen. So think about how this conversation could have gone if Jesus hadn't been so slick. Jesus could have opened the conversation by saying, "Howdy, I'm the Messiah. How are you?" He could have done. He he wouldn't have been lying. 
Or, hello, I notice you're drawing water at the hard, hottest part of the day, very, very far away from where I think you live. Is it because you're on your sixth bad relationship when most women only ever have one? No, he didn't start like that. She'd have probably smacked him in the face. <laughs> you see, Jesus takes the indirect approach. And that's his habit. It's playful and it's so cunning. Her face had to have been priceless. Later in the chapter, she runs to tell people about Jesus. It doesn't say that she's got her water bucket with her. I wonder if she left it there. Someone could have scavenged it. I don't know. And see, what Jesus doesn't do is throw the seventh commandment at her. Thou shalt not commit adultery. He's just saying he knows what her secret is. He knows what she's hiding. And in verse 25, she's as humble as we ever see her. John 4, 25, the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called the Christ, the anointed one. And when he arrives, he will tell us everything we need to know and make it clear to us. It's almost, almost, she's almost asking Jesus, if he is who she thinks he is now. Because he's darn sure not acting like a Pharisee. But he's acting like the Messiah that she mentioned. And then the other shoe drops. 426, Jesus said to her, I I who now speak with you am he. Now I have absolutely no backup for this assumption other than that it makes me laugh and I can see Jesus doing it in my head. I think he smiled and waved when he said it to her. Are you the Messiah that we've heard about? He is me. (laughs) Now, to get a better picture of Jesus' cunning, we can't leave it isolated. It works together with the rest of his personality, because a personality is not just one trait in isolation. It works together with his playfulness, his honesty, generosity, fierce intention, and don't forget the freedom. Let's see how Jesus handles the rich young ruler in Mark 10, starting in verse 17. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked, Teacher, you are essentially perfect morally, or you are essentially and perfectly morally good. What must I do to inherit eternal life, that is, to partake of eternal salvation in the Messiah's kingdom? Now, we could get the impression that this guy kind of thinks he's important. He runs up to Jesus and he kneels before him, essentially blocking Jesus' path. And he asked, what do I need to do to get what you're giving? That seems a tiny bit dramatic, doesn't it? So Jesus, and Jesus treats him just like one more religious person who's faking humility while being filled with a holier-than-thou attitude. Verses 18 and 19, And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me essentially and perfectly morally good? There is no one essentially and perfectly morally good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Now, it looks like Jesus is being direct with him, but I don't think so. See, now, he mentions all the commandments that relate to -to person-to-person conduct. He doesn't do a thing about the other commandments that are between the person and God. He doesn't mention, you shall have no other gods but me. He doesn't mention, you shall keep the Sabbath day holy. He He doesn't mention those. And Jesus tells him, basically, you know the rules, follow them. And my guess is that between verses 19 and 20, Jesus starts moving. He's handled this guy. Now, he's planted some seeds by leaving certain things out. That's what I think. But he's just on this mission. Jesus got places to go, people to see, things to do. We got to go. But Jesus is setting him up. And Jesus is cunning, like we've already seen, but sometimes I think it's even more so than we give him credit for. 
Now, the young man shows his sincerity in verse 20 through the first part of verse 21. And he replied to him, Teacher, I have carefully guarded and observed all these and taken care not to violate them from my boyhood. And Jesus, looking upon him, loved him. Now, I stopped in the middle of verse 21 because Jesus' attitude towards the man appears to do an about face. He went from trying to keep moving to having compassion and high regard for him. Jesus sees the man's heart for what it is, and like the Pharisees, he confronts him with the cause of his heart disease in the second half of verse 21 and verse 22. And he said to him, you lack one thing. Go and sell all you have and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come and accompany me, walking the same road that I walk. At that saying, the man's countenance fell and was gloomy. And he went away grieved and sorrowing, for he was holding great possessions. Jesus tells him, go sell everything, give the money to the poor. And he doesn't tell him that. This has been misconstrued for quite a while. He doesn't tell him that to start a prerequisite for living a religious life. But he tells him that because money was the idol taking God's place in this man's heart. God doesn't have any problem with wealth. If someone told you that, they're wrong. Poverty was one of the curses broken by Jesus on the cross. And Joseph of Arimathea, a follower of Jesus, is described as a rich man in Matthew 27, 57. He had, Joseph of Arimathea had the money to give Jesus a burial in a new tomb, wrapping him in linen, linen cloths and burial spices. Didn't run cheap. But Joseph wasn't told to give up his money because it wasn't an idol to him. You see, now the rich young ruler is face to face with the idol in his life, and his countenance falls because he just doesn't want to give up his stuff. He likes his stuff too much. It's his. <laughs> he thought he was doing so well, and Jesus just kind of spoiled the party. You see, but Jesus doesn't leave this young man, and he never leaves us knocked down. He extends the hand to help him up. He says, go sell everything. Come and join me. We can do it. But the man just doesn't want to give up his stuff. So he starts to walk away. You see, but this scene isn't finished yet. In verses 23 through 27, And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, With what difficulty will, all, will those who possess wealth and keep on holding it enter the kingdom of God? And the disciples were amazed and bewildered and perplexed at his words. But Jesus said to them, Again, children, how hard is it for those who trust, place their confidence, their sense of safety in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were shocked and exceedingly astonished and said to him and to one another, then who can be saved? And Jesus glanced around them and said, with men, it's impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Now, when Jesus is saying this, the young man's probably still in earshot. He just turned around and started walking away. Jesus isn't being metaphorical when he says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a sewing needle, not the eye of the of a gate or whatever, the eye of a sewing needle than for a rich person to get to heaven. And the reason that it's so tough is that the rich put their trust in their riches, and don't realize how desperately they need God. So, however, if you're financially broke, you know you need something. And if you stay financially broke, eventually, I would hope, you find out the thing you need is God. Tends to be a pattern. So, the disciples asked, then who's got a chance who, who can do this? Please put that away. Yes, sir. Thank you. 
And Jesus glanced around them. And I, you see, I think he was looking at the rich young ruler walking away. And he saw the seeds of a heart change taking place. And he tells them with men, specifically with this man, it's impossible. But nothing's impossible with God. He's almost saying, you watch, that young man, he, he'll come back. He'll come back around. See, we've got to keep in mind that every day Jesus woke up, he had advanced through the minefield and the war zone that Satan had laid out for him. He was one day closer to his goal. The prize was a human heart, yours and mine. See, now Satan has the high ground in this battle, which he got all the way back in Genesis. Satan traps people with abuse, with seduction, with religion. He's got a lot of tricks up his sleeve. And Jesus is taking the long way around. You see, he, Jesus doesn't use any power plays, though he easily could. He isn't forceful about people following him. Jesus seems reluctant to perform a miracle. He woos, he confronts, delivers, he heals, he shoots straight, and he uses intrigue. He lives out the holiness that he tells everybody about, and he knocks off the religious glaze from the Pharisees the whole time. And still, he lets people walk away if that's what they choose to do. Now, I said that Satan had the upper hand at the time of Jesus' life before the death, burial, and resurrection. And that's because he did. He has a legal right to his captives. And it had to be broken by a perfect blood sacrifice. So when Satan made his move to seal his victory, he didn't know that he had played right into the Father's plan. He didn't know the cunning that God operates in. See, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 through 8, it says, But rather, what we are setting forth is a wisdom of God once hidden from the human understanding and now revealed to us by God, that wisdom which God devised and decreed before the ages for our glorification to lift us into the glory of his presence. None of the rulers of this age or world perceived and recognized and understood this, for if they had, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. You're darn right they wouldn't have. It ruined all of their plans. Now, we love seeing Jesus cunning in the Bible, but do we love Jesus for his cunning today? I know a lot of worship songs. I can't think of any that use the words cunning at like a snake. I, I thought long and hard. I even went back to the hymns that I know, and I, I could not find that phrase anywhere. Do we see the actions of God as cunning? See, when we don't receive the answer to a prayer when we think we should, do you think it's because God knows what the timing should be and maybe we don't? Well, I'm glad you do, but some folks don't. Do we think that if God answers no, to a prayer, which does happen, that it's because he knows what's going on better than we do, and he's helping us dodge a bullet? Because I think so. You see, when we're imitating Christ, do we wonder how snake-like and cunning Jesus would act in any given moment? Probably not. Because it sounds unchristian. You see, if we refuse to acknowledge Jesus' cunning, it's because we want to hold on to our own naivete. Life should be easy. Life should be good. I don't want to deal with evil, so I'm just going to pretend that it's not here, that it's back over there and it's set for other people to handle. <clears throat> we don't want to navigate through sin either. See, it's easier to live a life of surface-level engagement just playing at church, praising mediocrity, than it is to dig in your heels and work to outwit the traps laid for us instead of having to pray for rescue from the traps all the time. 
Jesus never had to pray for rescue from a trap, though he navigated a minefield and fought uphill his entire ministry. You see, in John 20, verse 21, then Jesus said to him again, Peace to you. Just as the Father sent me forth, so I am sending you. You are going uphill through a minefield. I did it. I paved the way. Made your path straight. But you're still going uphill through a minefield. Hmm? No, I don't want to either, but if it saves souls, then I'm going to do it. It's comforting, isn't it? I promise we are starting to wrap up. In Luke 16, verses 1 through 9, in the updated Amplified. Now Jesus was also saying to the disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a manager of his estate, and accusations against this man were brought to him, that this man was squandering his master's possessions. So he called him and said to him, What's this I hear about you? Give an account of your management of my affairs, for you can no longer be my manager. The manager of the estate said to himself, What will I do since the master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig for a living, and I'm too proud to beg. He says I'm too ashamed, but I'm too proud to beg. I know what I'm going to do. So that when I am removed from the management, people who are my master's debtors will welcome me into their homes. So he summoned his master's debtors one by one, and he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? And he said, A hundred measures of olive oil. And he said to him, Take your bill, sit down quick, and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? He said, A hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. And his master commended the unjust manager, not for his misdeeds, but because he had acted shrewdly by preparing for his future unemployment. This is Jesus talking. For the sons of this age, the non-believers are shrewder in relation to their own kind, that is, to the ways of the secular world, than are the sons of light, the believers. And I tell you, learn from this. Make friends for yourselves for eternity by means of the wealth of, the un, of unrighteousness. That is, use material resources as a way to further the work of God, so that when it runs out, they will welcome you into eternal dwellings. Now this is a parable. This is a simple story with a spiritual lesson. Jesus is impressed with the cunning of the worldly people compared to the naivete of the believers. If we look at verses 8 through 9, Luke 16, this time in the message, it says, now here's a surprise. The master praised the crooked manager. And why? Because he knew how to look after himself. Streetwise people are smarter in this regard than law-abiding citizens. They're on constant alert, looking for angles, surviving by their wits. I want you to be smart in the same way. but for what is right. Using every adversity to stimulate you to to creative survival, to concentrate your attention on the bare essentials so you'll live, really live, and not complacently just get by on good behavior. I am not encouraging you to go rob a bank to pay off the church. Please don't get the wrong idea. (laughs) Now, there, there's a charm to the simplicity of Forrest Gump, but I'm not going to trust Forrest to save my life when the chips are low. I'll watch his movie. I'll yell, run. I'll be annoyed when he keeps going back to Jenny. But I am not going to trust him with my life. I'll trust God. Because look at the cunning way God deals with problems in the Bible. The Tower of Babel, people are getting together to build a tower into heaven. And God goes, well, that ain't going to work. Tell you what, make it so they can't talk to each other. That'll do it. Put, he put eternity in our hearts so that everyone would have a desire that can't be met by this world. And, the force, and it forces us to acknowledge God. 
to be honest with y'all, sex was a pretty cunning invention because if you told people, here is a daily sacrifice you have for 18 years, you are legally not allowed to get rid of them unless you die. Every day it's a sacrifice. I don't know if a lot of people are going to be parents. But sex is that good. <laughs> That's a wonderful thing to know that it's going on the internet, isn't it? <laughs> See, now, every, even the movement of the Holy Spirit in the church is cunning. It moves first here, then it's over there, and it keeps people from systematizing it and keeping the enemy from quenching it. Jesus is holy and cunning. Now, if you don't think so, I'd absolutely love to give you the introduction. See, now, I don't... One last note, and then we'll release. I know I'm running a few minutes over. I don't want you to get out of balance. The Holy Spirit would never lead you into imbalance, and I try to do the same thing. We remember that the cunning Jesus operated with was still being led by the Holy Spirit. It was still motivated by love. Everything Jesus did was a manifestation of love. There was never any, in mal any malice in his intent, although it was not a calm intent. It was a fierce intention. His playfulness, his generosity, his honesty, his freedom, and his humanity, none of those things were touched by evil or selfishness. It was only to be the complete manifestation of God's perfect love. So take this. Be shrewd as a snake and innocent as a dove. And don't just go out there looking to swindle people. Do it being led by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it's a witty invention or an idea. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit will give witty inventions and ideas. If you think, And sometimes they don't seem witty. But look at the man who invented the pool noodle. Look at the person who first got away with selling a pet rock. Before my time, but I do know they existed. <laughs> Witty inventions, cunning things. Those people never had to worry about a paycheck another day in their life. And they could, if God properly motivated them, if they were a member of their church, they could have used that to further the gospel. That's part of what God wants. But we sit here and we go, well, if I don't do anything bad to anybody, nothing bad will happen to me. I've been breathing a little too long to believe that. <laughs> I hope that this has been informative. I hope it's been entertaining. I hope most that, good, that seed has been planted into good soil. I hope that we take this word, like James said, and that we be doers of the word, not hearers only. That we take this and as we go, we look more like Jesus in all that we say and do and act and think. That we would get to know Jesus better. That we would love him best. If you'd be kind enough to bow your head, close your eyes, I'm going to say a quick prayer, then a benediction, and we will be on our merry way. Father, thank you so much for the time we had together tonight. Thank you, Father, for sending Jesus and for revealing yourself to us through him. Thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit that lives in us, whom, on whom we trust, in whom we trust. Father, we thank you that you are good. You can only be good. We thank you that everything you tell us to do is out of love, and everything that you do for us and in us and through us is out of love, even if we don't understand it at the time. I thank you that we got safely here. I pray that you would get us safely home and then bring us safely back. I speak a blessing on everyone here in the six major areas of life, business, home, social, physical, mental, and spiritual. Father, pour out your love, your spirit, your grace, your power in such a mighty way that when the rest of the world sees them, they'll say, surely these people have been with Jesus. If you receive that, say amen. Know that I love you all more than peanut butter. There is absolutely nothing you can do about it. Have a wonderful rest of your week.